Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We exalt your name. We invite you in even to this meeting. I invite you in, ask you to even show us more of who you are, aspects of who you are, of your heart, your heart for us. Thank you that you have great hopes in your heart that you desire to share with us even tonight. And just thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is among us. We invite you to increase, we invite you to do great things. We just ask that the seed that would be sown during this meeting, even Lord, would reap a tremendous harvest, would reap a harvest in many nations, that your sons and daughters would awaken to the season that they're in. They would carry your presence and glory as never before to every sector of society. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to talk to you tonight about the coming extreme world makeover. You know, there is, uh, this is a popular theme now. The world seems to be, uh, the appetite is stirred for extreme change and makeover. We have multiple TV programs and shows and anywhere from how to <clears throat> lose weight remarkably well, how to have your face reconditioned and look better in a moment and how your destroyed home can look great or be replaced in, a short, in short order. And really, there's an aspect of God that is in all this. He's really giving us an appetite and preparing us for extreme change, extreme world makeover that will be coming upon us, that is coming upon us. It's really, uh, it's particularly as we experience these first few months of this year, it's not hard to see, not hard to understand that we are living in very unusual times, just even as we experience just the various things of, this, of the first six months of this year, whether it's the uprisings in the Middle East, Arabic Muslim nations, where there is more change taking place in that region than in the last 60, 70 years. And, and it's hard to even quantify the nature of that change and how it, it could end up being change that hasn't taken place in centuries and even millennia in that region, the direction it's going. And we've had a series of uh, floods and snows and winds in different parts in our nation and different parts of the world that are unusually qualified and classified. They're no longer just saying, well, this hasn't occurred in 10 years or 20 years. It's, we haven't seen, this is a one in 1,000 years flooding. This is a, one, a once in 500 year. This is something that happens once in 100 years. It gives us an understanding that we are in times of extreme change. An extreme world makeover has already begun. And uh, we understand even in our, in our nation recently, we've had you know, tornadoes that haven't occurred in 90 years and there's been storms through the southeast that ha haven't occurred in similar time period or, or ever, and the, you know, just depending on who's rating it and what way they're classifying it. So these things are, are not for us to be frightened about. These are part of a manifestation of the times and season we live, and the Lord began to speak to me before this year. In fact, last year, I think I received three specific words from the Lord out of Habakkuk 1.5. And Habakkuk 1.5 says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will do a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. Now, this is a scripture that exists in the Bible, but it came to me in a very personal way. It came to me in a personal way when I was having an experience, an encounter with the Lord. Then I received it uh, via prophetic word from two prophetic vessels, uh, two separate times besides that. The Lord spoke to me and said, he says, Johnny, you have a lot of faith, a lot of expectation for what I'm going to do among the nations. And you're sharing a lot, even in your vision perspective of the seven mountains and how I'm going to invade every sector of society. And I'm going to be the God of all the world, of all life. I am the God big enough to confront every challenge in every sector of society. He says, but I'm telling you, son, he says, in your day, I'm going to do a work that you would not believe were I to tell you. You are going to be astounded. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will do a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. 
just that verse, Habakkuk 1.5, the word for astonished or astounded is the Hebrew word tama. And it means there's different ways this could be said. If we read it from another version of the Bible, look among the nations and watch. Brace yourself for shock. Something's about to take place among the nations and you're going to find it impossible to believe. And I want, first of all, just our hearts and spirits to be prepared for this because what we're about to experience, what already has begun among us, upon us, and through us, are the change of nations such as has never existed before. And this is a good word. The context of this, this scripture is intended to stand alone also, but even the contact, context, the prophet Habakkuk is complaining because righteousness is not manifesting among the nations. The Lord's letting him know that there is going to be a massive manifestation of its power and presence even then, but there's something for today. This is now an alive today word for us, and it's entirely connected to this seven mountain message where the, God is speaking to us that he is going to rise upon us, his sons and daughters, and invade every sector of society. I want to say right up front, though I don't have it in my notes, that this work among the nations, this astounding work among the nations, will be connected to and with how nations respond to Israel. This is not the focus of this message, but it's impossible to give this message without telling that. Israel will be the anvil upon which the destinies of the nations will be formed. It's happening even now. Nations will learn to fear the Lord. They will learn to honor the Lord based on even their interaction in a proper way with Israel. So this amazing, astonishing work that God is going to do among the nations, upon the nations, and through the nations will be connected greatly with things that are taking place in Israel, around Israel, and the nations as they respond to Israel. As these changes come upon us, we want to be prepared in our spirit that there are no guarantees of natural peace, that it is a time of intensity, whether we look at it as extreme birth pains coming upon the face of the earth, and extreme birth pains are just painful, and the closer the time comes for a greater thing to be birthed and there are dimensions of the kingdom, greater dimensions than ever are being birthed at this time, the greater those pains will be. But although there are no guarantees of natural peace, there are absolute guarantees of spiritual peace. We are to be children of peace. He is the prince of peace. He is our prince. He is in us. And if we understand that every storm, every trial, every earthquake, Every tsunami, every challenge that comes upon the face of this nation, of any nation, will carry in it. This is the direction the Lord gave me. He said, every tsunami, every spiritual tsunami, every natural tsunami will carry a door in it. And it'll be a door for greater dimensions of the kingdom of God. He says, you can miss it as a people of God if you're frightened by what's taking place. If you don't understand what I'm doing... If you are people who are not operating as sons of Issachar or understand the times, you will miss out on the opportunities. There's going to be more opportunities than ever. Let's go to Isaiah 40, 15. Surely the nations are a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they are fine dust. This is not telling us how the Lord considers nations. It's not that he despises nations. This is as it compares to his omnipotence. He's saying the nations, their existence, their resistance, their existence, anything about them is a very small thing for me. They are a drop in the bucket. I am going to do a work with them, on them, through them, using you, my sons and daughters, such as never been seen before. Part of the central purpose of this message is to get reconnected with the omnipotence and power and sovereignty of our God. Our God is huge. He's mighty. He's powerful. The hosts of heaven that are available and that are being activated in this time and season are huge. 
It's why I have a hard time fearing when I hear about the challenges coming and about people who see principalities are scared a lot because they see these things. The Lord has allowed me to see the nature of our army, of our archangels that are being activated and released. And the armies that are coming, each one of the seven mountains has an archangel associated with it and attached to it, and each one is coming with tens of millions of angels specifically for this time and season. And they are huge, they are impressive, uh, they are mighty. God could take care of this whole thing by himself, but he's got a very impressive army also. Isaiah 40 and verse 4. It says, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight and the rough places smooth. Again, it's giving us dimensions of how this extreme, this coming extreme world makeover. Every valley exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. Everything will change. What is up will be down. What is down will be up. This is really speaking of a work of justice. Justice literally means making crooked paths straight. We will see a manifestation of the justice of God as never before. And again, he's going to do this all in conjunction with his sons and daughters. Some of this is not a surprise for many people, but many people have put off all these things to the millennium. When Jesus comes, we're gone. He all of a sudden does all these things. The scripture is very, very, very clear, and we'll just look at some of the scriptures. The great thing he's going to do, he's going to do through his sons, through his daughters. He could have done it on his own anytime, any moment. He has enough power. It's, what is he waiting for? For him to just flex his muscle, feel like it? No, the whole deal is, again, he has told Satan, I am going to do this great thing with my sons and daughters. They are going to awake, they're going to arise, and they will begin to shine. They will operate in my light, in my authority, in my power, and they will change everything. I will not have to exert my own direct muscle. They will carry my muscle. They will crush you. In Haggai 2, we could read several verses there, but we'll just look at one. The Lord speaks and says, And I will shake... All nations, and they will come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. We want to take note just of the tone of that verse, because as soon as we hear, I'm going to shake all nations, we go, oh, no, he's going to come shake everything. It's going to be sad judgment, difficulty. But he follows up the statement, the phrase, I will shake all nations, and the desire of the nations will come. This is a good shaking. This is not a wipe us out shaking. Again, we've got to change our concepts of our God. We really are in need of renewing of mind as the people of God. We're all waiting for him to come and just show up on planet Earth and you know, show his muscles and make everybody repent. Do you know it would take God 10 seconds to cause the entire world to repent if that's his direct mission. If that's all he wants to do is get him to repent out of sheer fear. He could just go on the loudspeaker of heaven where everybody hears it immediately. Citizens of earth, <laughs> repent now! And everybody, you know, maybe a rebellious, rebellious, demonized person could last five more seconds. But in 15 seconds, the entire world would be on their face, weeping, shaking, and rattling just from him speaking his voice. That's how quick repentance can come. But he's not trying to get the world only to cry uncle. And we have thought that. We've expected that. We've preached that. We prophesied like, mm, God's about to come and make you all cry uncle. You know, you sinners. This is not the God. He says, I'm going to shake everything and I'm going to showcase myself as the desire, not just of individual people, but of nations. I'm the desire of nations. Nations want to know how I would govern. Nations want to know how I would run media. Nations want to know how I would run their families. Nations want to know how I would run their economies. Nations want to know how I would run their creative departments. Nations 
will learn to love me. I will have solutions. I will have the answers and the presence for every sector of society. He announces himself as the desire of the nations. That word, the Hebrew word for desire is a word, kemda. It means delight, desire, pleasant, precious, goodly. And interestingly enough, it's a feminine word, which we more associate with the Holy Spirit. You know, in, in the Old Testament, the word for Holy Spirit is a feminine word also. I'm not creating a new doctrine that the Holy Spirit is feminine, but that's still just the facts. And so it manifests a lot of what we would say the feminine part of God. I mean, we were made in his image, male and female. He made us and we're in his image. We know God the Father, God the Son. They both seem to lean towards the male side, the Holy Spirit. Somebody is doing some of the feminine stuff there also. Amen. We have to assume it's the Holy Spirit. That's why many of us who are married, sometimes we don't need to hear the Holy Spirit. We think we just need to listen to our wives. Or at least that's what they'll tell us, and often they're right. There's an aspect of understanding details, seeing details, taking care of all kinds of little things, paying attention to things that comes and manifests out of the mother heart of God, if we can say that. And he's saying, if again, we want to just point out what seems obvious, but sometimes people get these things backwards, and, and theologians amazingly do that, he didn't say, you, you can have read that scripture and think, oh, this is when Jesus comes. But he says, they will come to me. This is not about Jesus coming to the earth. This is about nations coming to the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit said in the last days, what Jesus said, I will pour out of my Holy Spirit on my sons and daughters and everything will change. And it's still what's going to happen. He's going to fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And he is the desire of all nations. We want to start seeing him that way. We want to start re-imaging him that way. We were made in his image. We are to see that image. We are to reflect that image. And we are to reflect that image into every sector of society. He's tired of being only reflected as a finger-pointing, judging God. And that is another message. Okay, let's go on. When is the extreme world makeover finished? Extreme world makeover is coming. When is it finished? Isaiah 11, 9 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a well-known scripture, but we want to again look at it in its more, say, nuanced form. The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Not just the knowledge of God, the Savior. We've understood that mission. We've understood the gospel of salvation. The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the seven mountain God. Of the God of all life. The seven spectrum God. The God who's like a rainbow comes in seven colors. That's just his primary colors. It's just his primary manifestations of who he is. He's very exciting. He's colorful. He's adventuresome. He's got a great sense of humor. He's a family man. He, he just, he's all the things that we often are not in the church. And we would know that if we just remember these, you know, the scriptures in Revelation 4 and 5 that tell us about the throne room, it is full of Lightnings, thunders, there's a rainbow around the throne. It's color, smells, sounds, and there's these crazy living creatures that run around saying, holy, holy, and there's just all this kind of activities like heaven is designed to stimulate to the max every one of your senses. He made our senses not so we die to our senses. That has been an entire religion on its own. Part of legalism, spirit of Pharisee that goes on. It's like... If it feels, you know, if it's enjoyable, it can't be God. Well, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand is pl are pleasures untold. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The coming days, the more intense the days become, the more joy we must carry and reflect. Because the kingdom is coming, and a vital aspect of this kingdom DNA is joy. And we must carry that joy. 
He's coming to showcase himself as the desire of the nations. The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He's not just going to showcase himself as God, the Savior, Redeemer on the mountain of religion. He's going to showcase himself as God, the governor, the ruler, the king, the one who knows how to lead nations, the mountain of government. He's going to showcase himself. There will be knowledge of the Lord as God, the creative one. He is even now invading Hollywood. In the future, it will be said, I've seen a vision, I've seen TV commentators talking to each other. And they say, is it my imagination or does it seem like the only movies that are doing anything nowadays are those coming from the Christians? And the other one says, yeah, I think, have you noticed the only songs going anywhere, the only, uh, the only music going anywhere is the ones coming from the Christians too. And then it just becomes like they just tripped on it and they're telling the whole world. He is not intimidated about competing with the creativity of this world and of Jezebel because Jezebel has zero creativity. She can only distort true creativity. And creativity has been misdiagnosed, misrecognized, and what is just perversion and distortion has been called creativity, but it's in the absence of the sons and daughters of the king manifesting the real stuff. And we're, but that's changing. That's already changing. It's going to change dramatically. And the whole world will take note that the greater creativity is coming from the household of God, and they'll say, why? And the sons and daughters of the king will say, well... We had an encounter with God. And this is where we got this stuff. And if you join him, if you become his son and daughter, accept him as your Lord and Savior, you can have access to this kind of creativity too. And it'll be a manifestation of seven mountain evangelism. So the knowledge of the Lord will fill all the earth as the waters cover the sea. He will showcase himself as God, the wise teacher, the educator. Our educational system and absolute crisis right now. They're talking about it all over. 40% of teenagers are not finishing high school. They see no value in it. They're bored. We have a generation that's bored with left brain, humanistic, mind of reason, studies and education. The system is shaking. They're saying we got to do something different. It's creating an opportunity for the sons and daughters of the king to manifest this face of God, that there be the knowledge of God in this way, the mountain of education. God, the family man, part of who he is, it speaks of the family of heaven. There's going to be knowledge of how the Lord is a family man. It's going to be God, the supplier, the provider, the mountain of business and economy. The world's going to know about it. He wants to showcase this side of himself. You know, our papa loves providing and supplying. We don't understand that sometimes, but it's because he also can't just keep giving us stuff if we don't know what to do with what he's giving us. If we're not going to be good stewards, he can't keep giving to us, just like when our kids, you know, it's in my heart to give my kids ice cream cones. But after about the seventh one in an afternoon, I'm going, you know what, this is not so good for her right now. <laughs> it's the same thing. If we don't know what to do with what he's giving us, he holds back. But as we begin to connect to our world transformation mission, we will have a better understanding of why he's blessing us and it's not just an end in itself. Again, these are all messages one by one on, the, on each one of the mountains, but this is when it says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The, the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of this God, the God of all life, the God of good news from the mountain of media. He runs heaven in that fashion and system. All these things exist in heaven. All these seven mountains, these seven systems exist in heaven. And in heaven, it's important that there's good news. Testimony, good news, they're happening all the time in heaven. It's just a, who he is. He loves good news. And part of him even telling us about the coming extreme world makeovers because our God likes us to have anticipation. He wants us to anticipate what he's going to do. So he's telling us, I'm going to shock you with what I'm going to do. I'm not going to tell you everything I'm going to do because I want to shock you too. But I do want to tell you it's going to be good. And he tells us some of the things so we can be excited ahead of time. 
It's like when we'll take our kids, since you have Disneyland here, you know, you don't, most of us anyway, you don't just surprise the kids one day, get in the car and you show up at Disneyland. You usually plan for it, well, it's particularly when you live far away from Disneyland. You plan it for weeks or months and you tell them and they look, for, you know, they're looking for, you know, ahead of, you know, it's like, oh, wow, it's coming about one week, one, you know, whatever, a day, and you're there finally. And so you enjoy it before, then you have the pictures afterwards, so you enjoy it maybe Disneyland more before and after than while you're there because the lines are too long while you're there, actually. <laughs> but he, we have a God who wants us to anticipate what he's going to be doing. Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Again, this is just backing up the original scripture there, but it's giving us the dimension of how much glory is going to be released as the waters cover the sea. As we point out, that's not 50%. The sea is not made up of 50% water and 50% you know, islands. It's 100% water. His glory will cover the earth to that dimension. That's why I'm telling, you know, people say, well, he might come tonight. He's not coming tonight. <laughs> this is not taking place. This God of all life, this God, the desire of the nations has not been showcased in that way yet. He's not coming tonight. I hope that didn't shock anybody. We could have told, you know, we could have saved camping some time there. But there are a lot of things, apart from the fact that no man knows the day, the hour, and all that kind of stuff, there's like there's a lot of things still have to take place first. Or God's movie is sort of a failure. He ends his movie in a good way. He doesn't show up on planet Earth when the only thing going on is, well, there's 40 million orphan aids. All the nations of the world are in turmoil. They're fighting each other. There's hatred. There's, you know, a million in the sex trade. And, 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 you know, everything's bad, bad, bad. Okay, let's cut the... Okay, cut, I'm done. My experiment failed. Our God doesn't have that kind of failure. That's just part of understanding who he is. He knows how to finish something, and he's going to finish something good, finish something well. And mostly, mostly key for us to understand is his glory is not something he's just going to do on his own. Like he's going to zap us away and come, okay, let me release glory everywhere, and there's going to be clouds everywhere. No. We will see a scripture that his glory is always to be seen on his children. He's going to do this connected to people. Sons and daughters are going to carry his glory. Amen? Amen? All right. I want to tell you real quickly about your IPA. You're like, what in the world is your IPA? Well, you need to know your IPA. To be part of this extreme world makeover, you really have to know your IPA. Your IPA, the three ingredients of your destiny. Number one, your identity. Number two, your purpose. Number three, your assignment. Your identity is your of God. Your P, your purpose, is your for God. Your assignment, this is the one most some have trouble with, is you're to be here as God. There's a scripture beside each one. We'll get to it so you're not thinking we're presenting some kind of alternative doctrine or religion. So your IPA, your identity. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is such an important thing God is doing, and he's, you know, and it's a generation that carries an orphan spirit. The enemy has worked to fracture our families. As he fractures families, it becomes easier for us to carry an orphan spirit. But we really just don't trust. We don't relax the way we're supposed to. We don't carry proper rest. An orphan is struggling with survival. Maybe 90% of God's people are more concerned with survival than thrival. When you know you're a son, you begin to step into thriving. You rest, you obey. There can be a difficult path to walk. 
She don't carry all the fretting that an orphan does. Again, the orphan spirit. Orphan spirit is, I have to take care of myself. I have to figure things out. I can't trust anybody else. And you can carry that same orphan spirit, most do, into the household of God, even as it relates ministry. And you have to make your own ministry happen because nobody's going to look out for you. You can't trust God. So this lack of experiencing sonship has many of us in difficulty. And so it becomes very important that we live out of an identity where of God. This means if we have received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are king's kids. We are royalty whether we feel like it or not. If you're waiting to feel it first, it probably won't happen. Your behavior doesn't align up enough usually for you to feel like a king's kid. And though we want to walk worthy of being king's kids, we are just because of our bloodline. You know, the princes over there in England, the United Kingdom, whether they behave or misbehave, they're still princes. And people still have to respect them and treat them in that fashion. It's not even a great analogy, but it's the closest thing we can think of on planet Earth right now. We are his sons. We are his ambassadors. We are ambassador sons. We are ambassador daughters here on planet Earth. We are of God, and it's a different changer, difference changer, difference maker. And because of these bloodlines, we are to behave differently. We operate out of identity. Must start with identity. This is a choice you make day in, day out. You choose it. You choose it enough until it gets ingrained into you and your spirit and you begin to manifest it. So many of God's people, even in the spirit-filled tribe, camp, they want somebody else to lay hands on them. They want another prophetic word so they will feel like a son or like a daughter. And it's good sometimes there's a powerful enough encounter that, that something happens, but often we, we have to come back again because... We lack the feeling. I'm not saying that every time, obviously, every time you come up for prayer, that's what it's about, and there's not good reason to get in the fire tunnels. I love them also. And we want to be touched by the Lord, but we don't want to use that in a substitutionary way. We want to step into a fire tunnel knowing we're sons, knowing we're daughters, and what other blessing of God he wants to release to us. Your identity. It's your I of your IPA. Your purpose Revelation 4.11 says, You have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. We could look at other scriptures too, but our purpose is his relational pleasure. So you are of God, you are for God. Your identity is you're of God, your basic purpose, you're for God. You're here for him. Particularly when you make him your Lord and Savior, that's what you're saying. You're here for him. So we want to get those things, the I and the P straightened out, and then we can step into our assignment in a better way. 1 John 5, 17 says, Because as he is, so are we in this world. John 12, 36, That you may be children of light. Again, this is where many struggle, think there we step into arrogance or high-mindedness, but it says, Because as he is, so are we in this world. And we are to be light. Again, these are scriptures we get used to. And, and, and so, we, you know, we can just throw them off. And yet if someone will, would be preaching, we are to have dominion to take dominion. There's all kinds of people. Oh, this is dominionism. This is back some doctrine from way back. Oh, what, who do they think they are? And if you use the word dominion, it becomes a problem. But if you say light, it's okay. Okay, we don't have to use the word dominion. But that's what light is doing. Light takes dominion over darkness. And as he is, so are we. What does the scripture say? For this purpose, the Son of Man came to destroy, to crush the works of Satan. That's a fairly dominating type thing. We're not here to dominate people. The message of dominion is not about dominating people. The message of dominion is about dominating powers and principalities and darkness and every work of Satan. And when we really get our IPA, 
We will do that on a daily fashion. If we operate out of our identity, out of our purpose, and our assignment. I want to get into the three stages of extreme makeover. This came from a vision, an encounter I had with the Lord. He gave me three distinctive prophetic timetables. One that we're already in, two more that will be coming. The first one started in 2008. The third one begins 2015. We will go through them here briefly. The three are awake, arise, and shine. And there is something specific associated with each one. We want to understand it. It becomes important to understand. We are speaking of the movie script he has invited us to be a part of. If you don't know the movie script you're a part of, you'll play the wrong role or have the wrong attitude. If, you're, if you think you're in the Alamo where it's about heroically being crushed, then you'll prepare yourself in a different way than if you're in some, I don't know what movie we could say, some Superman movie where you're the one that wins everything. And he has put us into a script where his glory will fill all the nations, where entire nations will become under the light of the sons and daughters of the king. And so we want to prepare ourselves in like fashion. We want to be in tune with the script he's laid out for us. So the first stage of awake. Isaiah 52, 1 says, Awake, awake, O sleeper. In the Hebrew, that word for awake means open your eyes. Get the right vision. The awakening, there is a great awakening that started in 2008. It started in Rosh Hashanah, September 29, 2008. Not the type of great awakening we're used to talking about in history. This is an entirely different awakening. This is awakening to the expanded horizon, the expanded dimensions of the kingdom of God. The seven mountain template is a template for understanding the higher degree of takeover that God intends to do in this last day. That it's not just about saving souls. It's not just about praying for people and them getting better. It's not just about casting out demons. It's not just about having a few good things take place while the enemy crushes us and showcases the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet. But what we're awakening to is that there is going to be a re-imaging of the face of God in all of planet Earth that there is a worldwide manifestation of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea that will take place, and we have a part in it. September 29, 2008 was Rosh Hashanah. It was the day the Dow Jones dropped a record 777.7. The Lord spoke to me and said, that marked the beginning of a seven-year great progression. Now, for better understanding that, it was actually in December of that year, I had been asking the Lord, I said, Lord, there's a lot of concern, a lot of prophetic gloom and doom, a lot of intercessors are feeling like this is the end of days. There was a lot of talk late in 2008. The great tribulation is upon us. We're going back to the great depression. You know, there's all kinds of ways it was being quantified. And in my spirit, I knew it wasn't, but I hadn't heard a word from the Lord specifically, and so I was inquiring of him. In December of 2008, I woke up in the morning at 3.43. Lord said, go to Psalms 34.3. says, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. And it goes on to say, we looked at his face and our faces were radiant. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And the Lord began to speak and said, my people have been magnifying their fears. They've been magnifying their anxieties. They've been magnifying what is being said in the media. They are magnifying things other than who I am and what I am doing on planet Earth. He says the next seven years, not only are they not the Great Depression, they are seven years, we look back as the Great Progression. 
that there will be a great progression of the kingdom of God. He went on to say, in fact, he says, even economically, I have one quadrillion dollars worth available for my Josephs to come get from me. That number blew me away. I hadn't even thought of that number since I was a kid. I had to see how many zeros that is past one, you know. But I don't know if it's meant to be a literal number or just like, you know, I have plenty. <laughs> Our God is not filthy rich, but he is righteously rich. And his glory already fills the earth in, in hidden contexts, in hidden ways, in things that need to be discovered. But beginning at that time, there was, it was such a shock to the body of Christ. He even told me the reason he was going after mammon in such a severe way beginning then. And we can see the society has recognized. Everybody looks back and says, we have been so greedy. We have been in la-la land. The world recognizes they were operating by greed, even if they go back to it. The Lord said, this is my mercy for my church because they've been operating under the same thing. He says, they will learn to trust in me. I'm weaning them from mammon. And I'm awakening them to this time and season. And so the first period is an awakening. We are an awakening from 2008 till 2012, Rosh Hashanah. And in this great awakening, again, I want to make it clear, the awakening is to the new dimensions of our assignment. The kingdom of God is coming, and it's coming to take over nations. There, in fact, there is no nation that is not potentially able to be taken over. Wherever sons and daughters of the king arise, there, then that nation can be taken, and it can be taken in a day. I know this is so... For a group of people that often are struggling to keep our jobs or pay our bills, and we talk about taking entire nations, it can seem like, I can't wrap my brain around it. But the Lord has to tell us these things so we can begin to wrap our brain around it. It's going to do a work in our days that we will be astonished at what he's going to do. And he's giving it to us piece by piece, little by little, but there are going to be greater and greater increments, and we are going to see manifestations, and we are seeing even this year entire nations change in 24 hours in some degree or another, so we know how quickly things can change. And we are to operate in conjunction with them. The greatest shame for me as I go around is seeing sons and daughters of the king who have no idea what that means who are operating as survivors. They carry an orphan spirit. They've said the prayer, Jesus come into my heart, and they go out as orphans. And so they don't participate. They don't cooperate. They don't coordinate with the great thing that God is doing in this last day. He has such amazing things for you to be a part of. He wants to use you. He wants to use the kids. He wants us to shine just as much as we want our own natural kids. We prefer them to shine over ourselves. It blesses our hearts for that to take place. This is not about us having arrogance and saying, oh, we're going to do this thing. You know, it's not about all that. It's about he wanting that for us. That's why he promises in Deuteronomy, you will be the head and not the tail above, not be no, below. It was, that's not our idea. That's his idea. He says, so all the nations of the world will see, all powers and principalities will see what I do for those who are faithful to me and loyal to me. He is proving something to Satan at the same time. So the first period that began, it's a three-year period or period of awakening, awakening to the seven mountain message. The seven mountain message is part of the tool for awakening God's people and in the awakening, there are the early arisers that are already taking place. We'll get into that in just a moment. But it's one of the reasons I'm not all that shook up. People say, well, what is the nation you've already seen that is in transformation? I said, there's not one. We're just awakening. We're just waking up to the parameters of the call. We're no longer just to hang out in church. We want to go from church, but it's in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be exalted on the tops of all the mountains and nations will run to what's happening on the sons and daughters of the king and through the sons and daughters of the king. And we have to hurry on here. Isaiah 60, 1, 3. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness to people, but the Lord will be seen upon you. The nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And please, let it get into your spirit how many times there's the you in yours. Not God and Jesus and the angels. They will be working with us, but he wants to shine on us. He wants to shine through us. After he tells us to awake, and that's what he's doing, he's causing world circumstances to assist us in awakening. One way or the other, people of the world and believers and Christians are going, you know what, we're in a little bit of a different day. Radical things are taking place as part of the awakening. And then they'll begin to get connected to the assignment, the assignment of nations. And then we'll begin to arise. For your light has come. Again, not instead of God, not in opposition to God, but as his kids with his heart. We were made in his image. His great pleasure will be to see us as his image bearers reflect him in society. And the light that is on us begin to eradicate the darkness of our cities and nations, and it will happen. It absolutely has begun already, and it will happen. That word arise means to accomplish, to be clear, to confirm, to decree, to get up, to make good, to ordain, to perform, to set up, to succeed, to be an uprising. That's what we're waking up to do. We're not waking up just try to rescue a few people before the devil beats the world to pieces and a, a you know, nuclear bomb blows it up. You have to distort one scripture of the Bible to believe any of that. In this vision that I saw... I saw that beginning in 2012, Rosh Hashanah. Again, that's the Hebrew calendar, the first day of the year in the Hebrew calendar. The vision that I saw, I saw the seven mountains of society that we're talking about. Seven sectors of society. Media, education, family, government, arts and entertainment and religion. But these seven mountains of society, not just the mountain of religion or worship, where we're used to operating, where we want to get people to sign on the dotted line and saying they gave their heart to Jesus. That's very valuable. We need that. We want to make sure that one day we're not in hell. Hell is horrible. Do not go there. If you're not saved, do sign on the dotted line. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. You do not want to go to hell. But he isn't just concerned about the hereafter. Jesus said, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The way these things function in heaven, let them come to earth. The way government functions there, let it come to earth. The way family functions there, let it come to earth. The way provision functions there, let it come to earth. The way creativity functions there, let it come on earth. And let it shine through your sons and through your daughters and let it displace the darkness that is on the seven mountains of society. In the vision, there were seven mountains. and It was dark and dingy. And I saw at the bottom of the mountain, this was the awakening period. And we were, God's people, we were, the position I was seeing it, we were all like little ants. And there was like this first period of awakening, the ants just began to move. And they were bright shining. And they weren't as bright when they were at the bottom of the mountain. They were just, you know, they're just accumulated by the thousands like ants at the bottom. And then a few, in this original awakening period coming up to 2012, there was a few that began to rise on the mountains, and we have that. We have stories we could tell you. There are the pioneers, there are those that are operating in every sector of society, carrying God's glory, carrying God's presence. They're generally having a tougher time than it's supposed to be because they're pioneers, and there's not enough of us together. The wisdom of mountain climbing is we wanna be roped together. But what I saw begin to take place starting 2012, I saw the base of East, all these mountains. I saw these lights, these little ants began to rise by the, th I just didn't even know the numbers, the innumerable, seems, seemed like tens of thousands on each one of the mountains. And they began going up the mountains. These glowing sons and daughters of the king, but they look like ants. My friend Bob Hartley, as I've shared, he saw some similar timing, some similar things God's doing among the nations. It's really strengthened and given me more resolve to believe and trust what God has shown me so the Lord showed him that there would be 50 million arisers. 
50 million Josephs. The Lord said, I'm going to send marvelous comrades with you. You're not doing this just one or two this time. I'm going to have, I'm going to wake up a bunch of my sons, a bunch of my daughters. You're going to enjoy doing this. You're going to lock arms to do it. You're going to do it as one. You're going to be roped together because when you're alone, when you're just pioneers, it's not working out so well. You know, even if you're a great soldier, if you're too far out of the rest of the army, you get picked off a lot, or at least wounded. So we need to go together, and there needs to be a lot of us. And our call is to re-image the face of God in every sector of society. Yeah. And it's going to happen. Yeah. It began to happen in mass by 2012. And the Lord showed me I have some... Just some visions and some things the Lord showed me about how that's going to show up in society. We don't have time to get into right now, but it's fascinating the things that will begin to take place. The number one attractions in the coming days will be Christian festivals that will draw hundreds of thousands of people. And people will come because the presence of God will be so strong there. The creativity will be so strong there. Stadiums being filled with this kind of event. There will be events of worship, that there will, it will be commonplace. People will come. The world will come because they'll say, when you go there, there's like literal cloud that comes down. And you feel, and it's freaky, man. It's like you feel stuff. And he said, then colors start coming out just out of nowhere. Go, no way, yeah. He said, I mean, Britney, you know, no knocking anybody, but Britney Spears and whatever concerts out there can't compete with his lights showing up when he decides with angels bringing all kinds of colors. I mean, God's show is about to come to planet Earth and it's going to be mighty, it's going to be powerful and he wants us to enjoy it ahead of time. Shine, part three, starting 2015. Arise, shine. Shine means to be or make luminous, to set on fire, to be glorious. Rosh Hashanah 2015 will signal the beginning of enough light on us that nations will begin to operate on our light. We will begin contending in earnest for nations beginning in 2015, Rosh Hashanah. And he will be orchestrating the shakings of systems and nations to work with us. It's not hard to believe that right now, the way things are shaking. The way things are working the things that are happening on planet Earth, it seems like every six months we advance 30 years in time. Every week, it seems like we're moving 10 years. We're advancing, you know, society. Technology, yes, but just the changes, the infrastructural changes of the systems of this world. It's not hard to believe. I used, I was, I, when I was first getting this from the Lord, I was like, wow, that's, per, that's, that's around the corner. Yeah, it's around the corner. We're, be preparing yourself to begin to contend for nations. That scripture that we read in Isaiah, nations will walk to the light of the sons of God. We're not talking about light so that just individuals can get saved. That's a good thing. We're talking about enough light that nations can function to it. It says kings will come to your brightness, prime ministers, presidents. They will say, hey, we can't figure out how our economy, we have no solution. Anybody know a nation with an economy with no solution? You know God has solutions like we were praying a couple of days ago, Lou Engle was with us, and as we were speaking into these things, he was getting as a revelation, I like the phrase, these last days, these coming days, that where we had known about the gospel of salvation, we're now going to know about the gospel of salvation. The God who through his Josephs will solve great quandaries, problems, crises. Be prepared to be a part of the gospel of salvation. Your, your assignment already, wherever you're at, if you don't know about the mountains, have to hear, read the books and listen to the messages and make sure you understand fully about the mountains. But wherever you're at, you are called to bring the gospel of salvation. There is some problem wherever you work that you can bring salvation. Salvation too. That's where we've already emphasized almost too much. We've shut doors sometimes going after that in too excessive of a way, but he wants to download strategies, presence, 
You know, sometimes the, sol the solving that we bring, the salvation, is presence, is peace. Sometimes it's something very practical, a new infrastructural way to proceed as a business, as a sports team, as a studio, as whatever. All right, we must close. All right, no then, let's keep going. No. <laughs> Matthew 25, 32 and 33 says, All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And what's he talking about? Nations. There will be sheep nations. Can't develop here. It's in my book, second book. Seven Mountain Mantle, the whole chapter on, I believe there's going to be at least 153 sheep nations. Not just Israel, 153. And I believe it's biblical. Prepare your spirits for that. Expand your spirits for that. Nations will walk to your light. Why does it say, ask of me the nations for an inheritance if we really can't have them? This is his idea. He wants to give them to us. And he didn't say, but don't ask for, you know, Iran's too tough. Prince of Persia's there. Greece, Prince of Greece is there. Forget that. Russia It's probably, I'm sorry, I need to use that as the dragon of the end time. There's a reason we can't connect this revelation stuff to nations directly because there's no nation he's not allowing us to ask for. And any nation that doesn't get taken will only be because a lack of sons and daughters of the king knowing who they are and what they're called to do in that nation. It would be a tragedy, really. He doesn't need to use a lot. He will save whether through many or few. And he is going to do an amazing thing. Just as I'm speaking to you, my heart, my spirit begins to uh, uh, just jump. And I feel his pleasure. I, I, I literally feel him right now like pushing me. Come tell him more. There's more to this. I don't even have words for it, but I know he's urging me, it's, this is going to be good. There's victory. I close out this thing with victory. Love wins. Love prevails. My face will shine in every sector of society, and it will overcome the darkness there. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the children of God. Amen. Says further on or in Romans 8, also creation groans and travails. Creation is groaning and travailing not for Jesus to return. We have so much suffering in this world. Jesus, please return. There is so much suffering, it's sad. The answer is arise and shine because your light has come. Creation itself knows that before he comes back, there has to be a great arising. The Father already told the Son, he said, sit at my right hand till I pour out my spirit upon your sons and daughters. They will crush Satan, then I'll send you. I just put together three or four scriptures, but it's in there multiple ways. Creation is groaning and travailing. I understand this more now just studying some quantum physics, quantum mechanics. At the subatomic particle level, we are all the same. Trees, we're not going to the pantheism, but trees, leaves, water, us, this thing, whatever you think, everything at the subatomic particle level is the same. It's a micro, tiny, spinning, singing donut. It's a frequency. It's the Lord's essence in us. Zephaniah 3 says, The Lord your God does the same thing above us. I am the Lord your God. I rejoice with spinning and singing over you. That's why they look into space. They see the eye of God. Have you ever seen that? Do a Google search. Hubble telescope goes as far as you like the eye. Like, oh my goodness. Whither shall I go from you? You're there. So they go as far as they can this way, and they go as tiny as they can, and they're about to make this official, and it'll really kind of devastate the whole concept of evolution. That's coming scientifically real soon. Because they will see, and he'll be there. It's me. 
I'm the little tiny guy singing and spinning under you, and I'm the big guy on top of you. As big as you can go, I'm there. As small as you can go, I'm there. I'm Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, and all things will be gathered into Christ, Ephesians 1 says. In him, the wrapping up, the summing up of all things. But trees, everything he created carries that essence of who he is. And so there's literally a groaning and travailing from creation. Some of these things we are experiencing are creation really groaning and saying, where are the sons? Where are the sons? Where are the sons? It's time to arise. It's time to shine. Time to awake, arise, and shine. So they're shaking things. They're shaking nations. They're shaking nations that have not allowed Christ in. They shook Japan and said, we got to have the sons in here. So the sons now got to go invade Japan and change things there. Daniel 12, 3. Those who are wise, the seeing ones, will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. Daniel 12 starts out with Michael standing up. It says, those days will be trouble like never before. And you can either hang on that one. Oh, no, I don't want trouble more than ever before. But it goes on to say, those who are wise, the seeing ones, those who awake, will shine like the brightness of the firmament. We're not talking about a little candle, not like this little light of mine. <laughs> this is a WMD, a weapon of mass deliverance. Those who are wise, the seeing ones, will shine like the brightness of the firmament. They will, not him. He will do it through us. We keep waiting for him to come do something else. He did. The cross was severe. It was thorough. It covered everything. All authority is mine in heaven and earth. Go there for take care of things. Yes, yes. And we're about to awaken to that. Yes. On the third day, for some reason, we wake up. Yes. We're on the third day. Those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. So it all ends as in Genesis 41, 57, it says, So all nations came to Joseph that's the story that's in the seven mountain mantle for more on that. But the idea there is Joseph was raised up really to save the world. Jesus, God, was not making the whole world get saved first. They were still lost. And he came and he had a plan and he sent Joseph out of the church. Not from attending church, but he sent him out of being with his ten brothers because everything must continue to flow out of attending church. But he sent him out of there, and he forced him. He took over his circumstances and forced him to the top of the mountain, and he had solutions. He could hear the voice of God. He could interpret dreams. He could receive dreams, and he was given a plan, an understanding of how that present-day society could be saved. And he didn't just save Egypt. First of all, we want to know he didn't just go there so there would be enough food for Isaac and the boys. We, got, we have all these survival. You know, the church, we got to run off and this, or at least the church, we can be. We're not trying to survive as the church. We are called to deliver the world. Yeah. It's, what, it's what Joseph came. These are deliverers. God is raising up. Choose to be one of the 50 million deliverers are going to be raised up. And he is awakening you. This message is entire designed to awaken your spirit, to prepare yourself to be a Joseph. You are called to deliver the world. I know some of you, this like just goes against some of your eschatology and theology, but it's from hell. I mean, the Bible could not be more clear. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Ask of me the nations as an inheritance. I will give them to you. He is seated at the right hand of the Father until all his enemies, all Jesus' enemies have to be under our feet. He is the head. We are the body. He's not coming back till that happens. That's not my idea. It's the Bible's idea. That scripture is there multiple times. Okay. It's not just going to be a cool thing. Oh, that's cool. 
what God's going to allow us to do. If we don't, nations will be wiped out. So there's an urgency to it. But he, he's working on that. He knows how to awaken us. He's doing that. He will continue to do that. He prefers to awaken us in a good way. You know how your kids, when they're asleep, wake up, sweetie, good morning. That's how he comes first. But after about 15 minutes, there's like water on us. <laughs> then ultimately, you know, torch to the bed. <laughs> Awake, son. <laughs> Your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. I invite you to stand. I want to pray with you. <laughs> You just raise your hands. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would release your breath, your wind in this place. You said in the last days that you would pour out your spirit on your sons and daughters. They would prophesy and change everything. They would speak to things and they would change. They would speak to dead things, they would come alive. They would prophesy means they would receive initiatives from heaven. They will receive strategies from heaven. They will receive the supernatural access to solutions, to the Joseph solutions for society. I ask right now, Lord, that you'd release that wind in this place. I thank you, you are awakening spirits of your sons and daughters. Your heart is so full of desire for your sons and daughters to awaken. You have dreams to release to them. New dreams. I declare new dreams, literal dreams. Declare new daydreams, new thoughts, new dangerous thoughts. Thoughts consistent with your IPA, <laughs> your identity, your purpose, and your assignment. Your identity, you're of God, little children. Your purpose, you're for God. You're here for Him, for His pleasure, for His assignment. Your assignment, you're to be here as God. You crush darkness, you bring joy. You bring peace, you bring creativity, you bring solutions, you bring answers, you restore the face of God. You reform the face, the distorted image of God in every mountain of society. The image of God has been distorted in the mountain of business and economy, so the world believes that you must have greed in order to have provision. We reform the image of God when we manifest a God who gives strategies, solutions, who supernaturally releases provision, enough provision for entire nations so that they can function and be restored. A little bit more. Come in, Holy Spirit. A little more. A little more. Pour. Pour into us. Pour into us. Pour into us. Pour into us. I just want to tell you, I'm seeing the Lord really is going to send new winds, new winds of revival, new winds of presence, new winds of wine, all the stuff many of you like. You know, the goosebumps and the presence and all that. But he really wants you to know this time why he's sending it. The coming revival winds, the coming revival wine, the coming revival waters are not an end in itself. They're to be connected to the reformation, the reformation of society. You're to carry this to the top of the mountain. The new wind, the new wine, the new presence will now carry solutions for the deepest, darkest problems of society. Come, Holy Spirit, more, more, more. More, 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 more. Release more of that presence now. It's your heart, your heart for the nations. Your heart for the nations. Your heart for the nations. Re release your heart for the nations, Lord. 
Yeah, he's going to send a lot of laughter with it because he wants us laughing all the way. Psalms 1 says that the enemy and nations conspire against the Lord and his anointed, but he who sits in the heaven laughs. <laughs> oh, ha, 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 ha. Think about it. It really is laughable, the idea of conspiring against the God of the universe. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> he could pinch them like this and they're done. The whole group of principalities, powers, nations, nations are at dust. He could do that. Of course he's like, he's, oh, they're conspiring. There's a conspiracy. <laughs> And instead, as Christians, we send these conspiracies by email to each other. <gasps> we got to rise up. There's a bad conspiracy. <laughs> Lord, give him that joy, your joy. Oh, <laughs> the joy of the Lord will be your strength in the coming days. It will not be the end in itself. It will be your strength so you can fulfill your task, your assignment, your mission of seeing the face and name of the Lord restored to all planet Earth. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.